Our next speaker is Dr. Manfred Kober, who was uh, born and raised in East Germany and has come, obviously, to the United States, and he has a master's and doctorate from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's taught uh, Bible and theology up in Ankeny, Iowa, uh, for a number of years, and he has an extensive ministry uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany and everything, as well as taking about 40 trips to the Holy Land, and uh, he has always been interested in Bible prophecy. And he helped R Russell Doughton with those famous rapture films back in the day, uh, you know, like, what, what's the name of that? Thief in the Night. Thief in the Night, yes. How many of y'all, Russell used to come, but I guess is his health? Russell. Yeah, you can, you can he, just tell us. But Russell had a slight stroke a little over a week ago, but okay. he immediately recovered from that. Okay. But Jerry Jenkins is offering a film award to a Christian filmmaker in California in the name of Russell Doughton. Oh, okay. And he was debating, would he come down here, or at least for the first time this award is given, would he go to California? And I don't know what decision okay. he has well, made, but he's here in his thoughts and his prayers. Okay. The bearded one. <laughs> yes. And uh, so he's going to talk about no tricentennial for America. Thank you, Tommy. All of you have spoken on the subject or written on the subject. Um, David Reagan gave us a book when we got here, America the Beautiful, question mark. We got a free book two days ago, uh, edited by Terry James, The Departure. There's a chapter on the future of America. And I'm glad you stayed around to see if there's anything new that can be said about the subject. I would like to leave you uh, with a very positive frame of mind. I've been attending here for about, what, 15 years? And some years, when we have that Tuesday night report, and certain individuals give a report, I'm sure we won't be around next year <laughs> for, for the conference because, you know, all these um, things that undermine our country and that are sure to destroy our nation in just a matter of, if not weeks, months. But here we are. Now, I know things are bad in America. I don't have a blind side to me. But let me tell you of an experience. Before I came to America, I was a little boy, 1953. I had just got out of East Germany. I was in West Germany. And the people with whom I lived were telling someone who was, he came to visit, hey, this boy is going to America. And the man sh sadly shook his head, 1953. America is no longer what it used to be. <laughs> I thought, well, what am I getting into? Why am I going to America? We in Eastern Germany were thinking, and I think most young people around the world think of America as we would call it from our German friends, Schlaraffenland, just the, four, uh, the courtyard of heaven, the closest thing to heaven. Well, when I came here with my eyes wide open in wonderment, I found out that America was much more beautiful. Things about America were much more splendid than I ever realized. I certainly thought I had reached heaven when I attended a school um, two hours in the morning to learn the English language, and my relative said, you're not going tomorrow. I said, why? It's Saturday, so... <laughs> I never thought of people not having to go to school on Saturday. <laughs> I was trained in the old communist regime where not just during the school year, but even during the summer you had to be with your teachers who tried to make little commies out of you. But at any rate, I know America has probably fallen a long way from where it used to be, not just in the last few years, but whoever, since its foundation, to be precise. But we started to fall from way up there when other nations were here and started to, their decline there. What I'm trying to say is, before we get to the subject matter, 
I'm not as pessimistic about America as some people are. God has ordained three institutions for the benefit of man. The home, the church, or shall I say congregation, (laughs) and civil government. As their biblical principles explaining what makes a godly family and a growing church, there are principles explaining what makes a great nation. If a nation follows divine directives, it can expect God to promote it, protect it, and, that's the key word, preserve it. Our nation has been graciously blessed by God more than any other nation because certain things are true in our country's background that are not true or only partially true so of other nations. We would like to consider four inspired passages and draw from them four important principles. They are not inspired, but you see if they are a logical derivative of these passages to explain why God has uniquely blessed the United States. From each passage, we will glean a major premise. From our nation's heritage, we will derive a minor premise, resulting in a hopefully cogent and sound conclusion. So we're using, for the first part of our discussion, a logical syllogism, major premise, minor premise, conclusion. Because the effects of these principles because the effects of these principles continue, God's blessings on America will also continue. That's prejudicing the case, but hold on. God stands by his word. Predictions concerning our country's demise are premature. America can boast unique features that are absent from other nations. The following discussion on the first part of this manuscript will point out some of these formative features of the United States and possibly give us hope for America's future. Part two deals with some of the major events of the end times, and you're all experts in these. In part three, an effort is made to to discern America's place in the context of prophetic predictions for this planet and its nations, including the United States of America. I agree with Rush Limbaugh when he keeps talking about America's exceptionalism. I knew next to nothing about America before I came here because the communists uh, kept us in the dark at what was really going on in the United States. My relatives had come here in the 1920s, but they couldn't communicate directly to us. They had to send mail by way of neutral Switzerland in the war years, and especially right after the war. But uh, my, my rejoinder when I came to America was that of my relatives who've come from Germany since then to visit. They say, Manfred, you've told us a lot about America. You've showed us a lot of pictures, but we never thought that country was so wonderful. I love Germany. I'm still a German. I'm, I'm a naturalized Texan, believe it. Can you tell by my accent? <laughs> Dallas County Courthouse, Dallas, December 18, 1964. I became an American citizen uh, while I was a student at Dallas Theological Seminary. So I'm proud to be an American, and I'm no longer a German citizen. But I think this country is very, very special, especially when it deals with, when it, uh, ha- that has to do with certain biblical principles. The first one is found in Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. The genuine piety of our founding fathers. Tim LaHaye has written probably several books on the subject, some of you have. Mal Couch has some excellent books on the table out there on that subject. But there's an interesting passage in the context of the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, other gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and now comes the contrast, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. As the 12 tribes of Israel were camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, 
they were about to be fused in a nation, into a nation, incorporated in the, in the Ten Commandments, which are directed, we believe that as dispensationalists, directed to exclusively to Israel, there's a timeless principle which applies to any nation. If a nation begins by an ungodly, idolatrous nucleus, God will mete out punishment to the third and fourth generation, Exodus 20, verse 5. However, if a nation is initiated by a group of godly founding fathers and founding mothers, God will bless that nation to a thousand generations. Now, in the Exodus 20 passage, the word generation is not there, but it is in the parallel passage of Deuteronomy 7, 9. The premise of Exodus 20, major premise, then is this. God will bless even the remote descendants of the godly people. The minor premise. I think America is the only nation that I can think of that started with settlements of individuals who were sold out to God. Not that every settler who came to these shores was a Christian, but uh, well, as we'll discuss, the founding documents all enunciated their deep faith in God and their deep desire to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So although denied by many, our nation more than any other nation was established by a group of godly men for God's glory. Though rejected by revisionist historians, this truth can be demonstrated from early American documents. I mean, all you have to do is read the early documents on the internet, wherever you want, Virginia Statute or New England Confederation or the Mayflower Compact, and it's all there. The Mayflower Compact framed in 1620, for instance, by the first permanent English settlers in North America, gives three reasons for their settlement. Some of you may have memorized that. Having undertaken for the glory of God, and the advancement of the Christian gospel, and the honor of king and country to plan this colony in these northern parts. That's the first time a group of people selected on their own government. The selection on board of the Mayflower was the first secret ballot, as far as I know, in the history of the world. They loved God, and they loved the gospel, and they loved their mother country. And if the king of England, who was a German, unfortunately, right? <laughs> uh, if the king of England had not made it impossible for the colonies to exist, as he tore to shreds every agreement he made with the settlements, we would still be loyal Englishmen. And you in England would not refer to us as the colonies. <laughs> Even in Jamestown, founded in 1607 as a strictly economic venture, the first charter of Virginia of April 10, 1606, expressed the same desire in propagating the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. I don't know of any other nation with the beginning clusters of settlements, which then fused into 13 original colonies and became a nation that had that godly a beginning. Not every colonist in those formative years was a Christian, but on those early vessels there came not just sailors, soldiers, servants, and scoundrels, but saints. These individuals helped lay the foundation of each colony. Their Christian piety influenced the colonial politics. They had one overriding passion, to share the gospel, both with their neighboring settlers as well as with the noble savages. It is they who qualify for the promise of Exodus 20, verse 6. How many of you studied under Dr. Dollar at Dallas Seminary? Some of you had Dr. Dollar. I had so much church history in Germany before I came to Dallas Seminary, I studied at the University of Erlangen, that I didn't have to take any history class, but Dr. Dalla had a reputation of being a good fundamentalist. I wanted to study under him. I uh, took a course in American church uh, fathers or something like that. And I went to, to the university in Denton 
to do research on microfish on the early settlers in America. And there was book after book that I guess is no longer published except it's on microfish or microfilm of these early settlers, many of these pastors going into the wilderness areas to evangelize. I think somebody could write a doctor's dissertation on that. Those were not just pious phrases, we've come for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian gospel. They actually car carried that out, and if you know the story of Roger Williams, he had mastered five languages in Europe, and the sixth one was easy to learn, and the seventh, and he evangelized the Indians, wrote grammar books, so others could put Indian languages into writing and translate the Bible and so on. So their desires were actually translated into practical activity of worshiping God. What was the first building they put up in, in uh, Massachusetts at Cape Cod? Not a house to shelter them against the inclement, cold New England winter, that was Christmas time, 1620, but on top of the hill, a meeting house. The first building erected by them was a church. Of course, it served a dual purpose with some cannons on top to ward out the Indians. But it's so interesting that they really were convinced believers and wanted to make Jesus Christ known. Just read William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation sometime. The conclusion, our country today is blessed not because of what we are in 2010, but because of what we're, we were in those early days when a band of believers framed the foundation of a cluster of colonies with one overriding purpose, for the worship of God and the witness of the Christian gospel. God promised blessings to how many generations? Thousands. Do we take that literally? Ah, oh, no, it's all symbolic. I take it literally. How long is a generation? Well, in the Bible, sometimes about 20 years, sometimes 100 years, like Genesis 15, four generations of Israel in Egypt, that's 400 years. Say a generation is 25 years. God said, if a nation begins with the godly nucleus, I will bless them to a thousand generations. How many generations have we exhausted? Subtract from 2010, 1620, and you come up with 390 years, divide that by 25, and you have, what, 15.6 generations, or 16 generations. How many do we have left? Uh, if you make it a thousand, quite a few, right? I don't think the rapture is that far away. Relax, Tim, I know the <laughs> Lord's coming is probably a lot closer than most of us realize. But say, say if we still existed in the far distant future as a nation, there would still be a measure of blessing. I don't say that's the only reason why we keep existing as a nation, but there'd still be blessings from God upon our nation, not because of what we will be then, but, but because of what we were in our very beginning. In those final days of World War II with the American bombers flying overhead, and I still can see here the, the, the uh, droning of the, the uh, airplane noise in my ears, and I watched them bomb a city of Plauen eight miles away. Two hours' time, 20,000 people died, but and my relatives, aghast at what was going on, said they were pre-tribulational, but they thought this was the end. Somehow the tribulation had come upon. It couldn't get much wor worse on this planet. The world could not get any worse. That was in 1945. <laughs> what they failed to realize eschatologically is when the tribulation comes, it will be a worldwide period, not just located, isolated in one geographical area. So assuming that a generation is about 25 years, we've exhausted only 16 of these generations. The promise strongly suggests that God's blessings will continue. So why has God blessed us and will continue to bless us? Because of the godly character of our founding fathers. Secondly, because of the gracious promotion of the Jews, and many of you can speak more eloquently on that than I can, but 
There's a major premise in Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Happily, I had a very godly grandfather on my mother's side, and I remember, I don't know how far we were in the, the war, but we were crossing the main street of our town, a little town of Falkenstein in the province of Saxony, and he liked to stop and talk with any person. There was no, no traffic in those days. We didn't have any cars. And he talked with a person. He said, Hitler might as well give up on this war. He has lost it before he has begun it. Because as soon as Hitler got into power in 1933, the Kristallnacht took place, where all the windows of the Jewish stores were smashed. And my grandfather said, Israel is God's plumb line by which he's going to judge the nations. And Hitler has touched the Jewish. We didn't know anything about those concentration camps. That didn't come out till after the war, as far as we were concerned, as far as we knew. But he knew the Jewish people were persecuted by Hitler. And this is why toward the end of the war, we had in our basement a special safe room hidden behind boxes where Jewish people were hiding till the coast was clear and they could make it eastward. I hope many of them made it to Israel. Somehow the Gestapo must have known about that because when the communists, after the Americans came in and pulled back out, the communists came in from the east and they rifled the city hall and they found a list the Nazis had left behind and that list indicated who the next deportees should be who would be deported to Buchenwald the closest concentration camp. And it was our second cousin's husband, who was the mayor of Falkenstein, who said, guess whose name was at the top of the list? Hermann Wolf und Familie. Hermann Wolf, my grandfather and his family. So if the war had lasted three more weeks, I wouldn't be speaking here at all. But, praise the Lord is right, but our nation has blessed Israel. The major premise is God will treat a nation in accordance with how they treat the nation of Israel. Those who promote and protect Israel will experience the blessing of God. Those who persecute Israel will be cursed by him. As God avowed in Jeremiah 30, 20, I will punish all that oppress them. Ahmadinejad, are you listening? <laughs> As somebody said uh, in a recent presentation, we can't wait to see what's happening, uh, what's going to happen to him. History is replete with illustrations of nations that persecute Israel. The God of Israel in turn punished them. I have a German book. It's entitled Die Juden in Deutschland, Die Geschichte einer 2000 Jahre alten Tragödie. The Jews in Germany, the history of a 2,000-year-old tragedy. <laughs> you could write a book like that. The Jews in England, with the exception of uh, certain periods of English history, the Jewish people were persecuted. The Jews in Spain, the history of a 2,000-year-old tragedy. You can't write a book like that about America. Where are these ancient empires, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, their empires crumbled, their races vanished. Why did they disappear? There's one major reason for the demise of these uh, peoples. They touched God's people. Israel is God's special treasure. Even when they're in unbelief, or shall I say especially when they're in belief, God calls them what? The apple of my naish, the little man in the eye, the most precious part in the human body in, in Hebrew thinking. Deuteronomy 32, verse 10 and Zechariah 2.8. Do the Jewish people today recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah? No, most of them do not. Are they still the apple of his eye? Yes, they are. And God said, if you touch Israel, you're touching something that is very, very precious to me. I'm glad I come from a family where that was remembered and practiced. I'm glad I live in a country where historically we have done that. As I mentioned down below in the minor premise, our love relationship with the Jewish people began when Roger Williams, the first Baptist in America, established Providence Plantation 
and he went to Europe and he begged the European persecuted people, especially the Jewish people, to come to Newport, Rhode Island and establish the first synagogue in 1656. Our nation's history then demonstrates that we have never been guilty of persecuting the Jews but have helped them more than any other nation. I say on a, governmentally ba uh, on a, government ba a governmental basis, there have been individual anti-Semites. There have been magazines published in America. And I have used some in the classroom to show to my students the extremism of some American very, very right-wing groups. They advertise a book, Adam, a creation of God, the Negro, a descendant of apes. Those magazines no longer exist, but the, you know there were parties and groups that were anti-Semitic, but not on a governmental basis. The minor premise is that the, the United States holds a unique place among the world's nations in relation to the Jews. Unlike other nations, we have never once had a governmentally instigated persecution of the Jewish people. Then I mentioned the Toro Synagogue in Rhode Island. Our nation's history demonstrates that we have never been guilty of persecuting the Jews, but have helped them more than any other nation. And what was God's promise, the major premise? God will treat a nation in accordance with how they treat the Jewish people. If that nation blesses them, God will bless them. If a nation persecutes Israel, God will punish them. Former President Jimmy Carter, whatever you might think of him and his recent enunciations, echoed the sentiments as the President of the United States, now he's speaking as a private citizen who doesn't seem to know which end is up, but uh, <laughs> Well, do you read the books he writes and the statements he makes? Incredible. But anyway, as the President of the United States, when Israel turned 30 years of age, at its 30th anniversary, he said, as the President, I have the newspaper uh, quote, as the President of the United States, I can say without hesitation that we will support Israel, not just for another 30 years, but the next 10. <laughs> no. Forever. Other American presidents have made similar statements. Now he seems to be uh, too much pro-Palestinian. Uh, not that you have to be against the Palestinians to be pro-Israel. And certainly I feel sorry for those poor, poor people who live under a dictatorial government, both on the Gaza Strip and on the West Bank. But the point, the general point is this. There's a reason why God has blessed us and will continue to bless us. It's because of our blessing of Israel. In Genesis 12, 3, God promised continuous blessings upon those who bless Israel. Our nation has had many differences with Israel. You sometimes wonder what goes through the minds of those government leaders in Israel, but it has never, we've never as Americans failed to promote and protect Israel. Because of our gracious promotion of Israel, God has greatly blessed us as a nation. Don't forget that. When you think about the future of America, keep the fact in mind, we are established, unlike other nations, by a godly band, and God promised continuous blessings for how many generations? A thousand. God promised to bless those who bless Israel. Thirdly, the great preponderance of Christians. In Genesis 18, we have a very interesting chapter where God comes down and uh, talks with his friend Abraham to tell him what's going to happen in the next chapter. He's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You all know the passage. Maybe you've mem memorized even. And uh, Abraham tries to teach God theology by saying, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> God didn't know that till Abraham uh, mentioned that to him. <laughs> what happens is an evidence of almost immeasurable patience on the part of God. He could have zapped Abraham. Abraham said, hey, but how about if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom? I won't destroy it for 50. 
How about 45? No, for 45 I will not destroy. Uh, let me speak just once more. Per adventure there be, you know, 40 and 30 and 20. And God just puts up with that. And then he has God down to 10, supposing there are 10 righteous people in Sodom. And God says, for 10, I won't destroy it. And Abraham goes away. He's okay. He knows there are at least 10 converts outside of Lot in Sodom. There weren't, were there? As it turns out, apparently there was just one saved individual. Lot's two daughters showed up by their actions that they were not truly saved. Lot, you wouldn't know it from the Old Testament account, but based on 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7, 8, three times it is said, his righteous soul was vexed from day to day. But uh, the details aside, the main thought I want to glean from that passage, the major premise is this. God is very reluctant to destroy a righteous place or shall we say, a wicked place with many righteous people in it. My last statement under major premise, God will normally not destroy the wicked without first delivering the godly. The minor premise, God always judges sin. He's not forgotten the sins of America and will settle the score someday. And when you list the sins of America, as many of you have done, and done well in your books and your articles, uh, don't forget that there are other nations, not that we should compare ourselves among ourselves, but there are other nations where drugs, pornography, crime, the sins that we could mention about America are much more prevalent. How come these nations still exist? How come Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, and so on, haven't been judged for their sins. Well, there may be other reasons, but I say, hang on before you say America is doomed. America has reached the point of no return. I don't want to go that far, okay? I want to send you home with a little positive message. <laughs> now, the well-deserved and long-delayed judgment upon America will come. I think America will be judged for her sins, and they're grievous if that's all you look at. Some say that if God does not judge America, he's owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Do you remember last year, Chuck Misler quoted Billy Graham to that effect? And I've heard it said, if God is not going to judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. I say to myself, I wish that person would read closely the text where it says in Genesis 19 for that all the men of Sodom were homosexuals all of them now the Kinsey report said that 10% of Americans are homosexual actually that turned out to be a fraud spurious it's uh, m a much less percentage but these two cities actually there were several cities in the plain that were destroyed and probably 1900 BC, these cities were indescribably wicked. And they didn't have a godly beginning. They didn't treat the Jewish people well. I'm saying America's sins will be punished, but not until and unless the godly element from America has been removed. How many Christians are there in America? I don't know, I've seen the statistics. Somebody mentioned the other day 65 million evangelicals. I hope that's true. Some have estimated that we have 80% 80 80 of the world's born-again Christians here. I hope that's not true. I hope there are more believers overseas as well. And I've been teaching at a Bible college for 30 years where our emphasis had been very strong on the pastorate and on missions. And I get to speak in my uh, former students' churches in Europe four times a year to help them in their ministry to reach the German-speaking people either in Germany, Austria, wh wherever. Now, if you went to Europe on a given Sunday, you could drive through any town and see no traffic. 
I don't know how it is in England, but in, in Germany, maybe two to three percent of the population attends church regularly, which means, by s statistics, once a week. In the United States, 43 percent. In Iowa, 53 percent, the latest statistics I've seen. Not that they necessarily attend a Bible-believing church, but it shows something about the spiritual tenor of America. And we have in America a movement called the Fundamentalist Movement, comprised of some 17,000 Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration. So, conclusion, God the righteous judge is very reluctant to punish a wicked place unto first delivering the righteous. Our nation has been uniquely blessed by God with the world's majority of believers. It is because of their righteousness that God has ex exalted our nation. You all know Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation. Uh, the America's righteous, Mexico unrighteous, Canada righteous, uh, Guatemala, no. Righteousness in the Bible is a personal relationship to God through Jesus Christ. The more p Christians you have in a country, the more righteous that nation is. The more God will exalt that nation. And in our nation, we have lots and lots of Christians. I live in a real small Iowa farming town, 10 miles northeast of Des Moines, Bond or Ranch, you've never heard of it, just fine. Um, when I first moved there with my wife, we were surrounded by believers. And I didn't that, think that was unusual. Our next door neighbors up the street, we had a coldest living next door who belonged to the Worldwide Church of God, and I've had a chance to witness them many times. But around the corner lived a Christian couple, and one day my wife and I were home, and there's a big boom, and the house had disintegrated, blown up, and pieces of uh, the house, the siding, were blowing in our direction, so we quickly went over. It was on a Saturday to see if we could help. It looked like help was too late. Happily, nobody was home, but the house had disintegrated. Right in the middle of the kitchen was the kitchen table, and on the table was an open Bible. <laughs> what a testimony to the town. When I'm in town on Saturday, I go uh, to a restaurant with one of, one of my former colleagues from Faith, some of you know Dr. George Houghton. He taught at Dallas Seminary for a while. But I had some German relatives along, and there were some two men coming out of the restaurant carrying a Bible. And these German friends of mine, relatives, said, what are they doing with the Bible? I said, they probably had a Bible study. And then when we sat down for a meal, there's a family on the corner table bowing their heads in prayer, praying out loud, and an elderly couple across from us. And then, of course, we prayed we thank God for the food. Now, I don't eat in that many restaurants in Germany, but I've never heard, I've, I've never seen anybody bow his or her head in prayer over a meal. Until I was at Burger King's in the Nuremberg train station, I was in a hurry, I wanted to get a quick hamburger, and I was sitting there reading a paper, and, and across, two rows across, was a young lady, she got her meal, and before she ate, she bowed her head. I thought I would compliment her, to encourage her. So after I finished my meal, I walked over and very graciously tried to say, I want to compliment you on bowing your head in prayer and thanking the Lord for your food. She looked a little startled. She said, I was just tired. I was just looking down. I wasn't praying. <laughs> <laughs> so I have yet to find somebody. Uh, Johannes, maybe you and Gisela have found uh, people in the restaurants in Germany bowing there. When you come to America, when I fly back from Germany, what's the first words you hear from the, the, from the agent where you show your passport at O'Hare Airport? Welcome back home. I've never had anybody say that in some other country. It's just a Christian consciousness on our nation that is still strong, not as strong as, as it used to be, to be sure, so I want to leave with you the principle that God will judge America. Before he judges, it appears that he first will remove the born-again believers, and that will be in the rapture. 
and they may, that may be this very afternoon, this very noon before we go home. A fourth reason why God has blessed America will continue to do so is because of his grand purpose for America. In Acts 17, 26, Paul is speaking to the Athenians on Mars Hill, and he lays, lays down a timeless principle. He says, God determines two things about each nation. The geographical boundaries where a nation is located and the chronological limitations when a nation begins, 1776, and when a nation ends. That's in God's good providence. He decides that. The borders between America and Canada United, are here, between the United States and Mexico are down here. Why? Because God has determined that. What does that mean? Whatever else it means, and in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, we read that God had Israel in mind of all nations. When the Lord God gave the nations their inheritance, he plotted them on this globe in relation to, somehow in relation to the nation of Israel. But there is a principle that God has a special purpose for each nation, as he does for each person, as he does for each of his creatures. So major premise, God has a special purpose for each country. Minor premise, the United States is not specifically mentioned in Scripture, therefore we cannot point to a passage and extrapolate it from it, um, God's purpose for our nation. The silence of Scripture, however, is compensated for by the frequent observations of our founding fathers concerning the divine design of America. I already mentioned the Virginia Statute. We've come to bring the gospel to such people as let in, live in darkness. The Mayflower Compact, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, when you think of it, and uh, that was, uh, leads too far afield, but Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and one other individual were the ones who were de uh, delegated to de develop a seal to picture America's destiny, which eventually turned out to be the eagle, but that was not adopted till, fifth, till 1905. They first, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, almost got into fight with one another because Thomas Jefferson and you can find that in the book, God's New Israel. Thomas Jefferson suggested our nation's destiny. And as far as we know, he was not a born-again Christian. He was religious, but he cut all, out all the miracles from the gospel story in his, in his New Testament, the ethics of Jesus, he called it. But he suggested the, our nation's destiny be pictured by the nation of Israel going the, through the Red Sea. Moses delivering the Israelites safely on the eastern shore. Behind them, the Egyptian forces drowning. Benjamin Franklin said, that'll never do. I want our nation's destiny to be pictured by the nation of Israel. Going through the Sinai, before them a pillar of cloud leading them, behind them a pillar of fire protecting them. Were they millenarians? Were they post millenarians? They couldn't care less about the future of that nation. They just knew something that even the, the Puritans in New England taught, that we were to be a city set on a hill. Israel in the Old Testament had abdicated its responsibility to be a lighthouse to the nations. So God seems to have raised up the United States to make that a lighthouse, not just for political freedom, but spiritual freedom for the rest of the world. So, God ordained it, our nation to be a, a hope for the world's unsafe and the home for the world's oppressed. We send out missionaries to all countries and absorb immigrants from all nations. People hated and hounded elsewhere have found a home here. The motto, A Pluribus Unum, out of many one, suggests our national destiny. As our founders saw it, this was something totally new, a Nova's order Seklohom, a new order of the ages. They were establishing a nation where everyone would be welcome and a nation that would bear a witness to the world. That's why I came. America welcomed me. That's why you or your uh, 
fathers or your parents or grandparents came. America, however, imperfectly has been true to, to its destiny. We have been the lighthouse of the gospel of the world's approximately 50,000 evangelical missionaries. Maybe you have more up-to-date statistics than I do. 45,000 come from the United States. We're the land of refugees and immigrants. The boat people from Vietnam as well, the captives of Castro's Cuba, are all, are all welcome here. The rejected, the refugees, and the refuse of other nations find a refuge in the United States. God has blessed us because we are fulfilling his destiny for our country. As long as we are faithful to that destiny, God will be faithful to America. Now a word about the end time, just in, in summary fashion, the end times and the nations. Without question, the United States is the number one world power. With the events predicted for the tribulation and second advent drawing ever nearer, is it possible that our country is exempt from these major world events? Let us note the major geopolitical events predicted for the end times and then see if we may possibly find clues as to the future of America. If we may, Tommy, go or Dan, go to the, the uh, diagram, I think I can summarize the next section. We have a timeline there. Uh, showing the two phases of the Lord's return, the rapture, where Christ comes back for us, seven years later, the second advent, or revelation, when Christ comes back with us. There are five major geopolitical events during that time. The rapture, uh, the uh, tribulation begins with that second triangle when Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel, Daniel 9.27. And then we have during the first three and a half years, the time of protection, when Antichrist protects Israel, it, um, the Antichrist conquering Western Europe, the conquest by Antichrist, and this is where that ten-nation confederacy that we've spoken of fits in. Uh, Daniel 2, and could we go to the next uh, picture for it one second? Daniel 2 speaks of that would be the last one. There's one in between. Okay. They, they have that image so well in their, in, in their minds. There's Daniel 2, the world's empires between Daniel and Christ's kingdom, from man's point of view, is a beautiful, glorious image. And Daniel 7, the, f the four world empires from uh, God's point of view, is ravaging beasts. Daniel has the vision in Daniel 7. And whenever you have a highly symbolic passage like that, God has in the context the interpretive key, like the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel 37, the house of Israel is the Valley of Dry Bones, and so on. And here too, and the, the um, ten kingdoms are the final stage of the image with the ten toes, and that beast that has no counterpart in nature, that fourth beast, with the ten horns, and then the Bible says another horn arises, and he'll subdue three of those kings represented by the horns, and by implication, seven will voluntarily subject to his rule. What happens, and Dan, we can go to that last diagram now. Somehow, after the rapture, I scroll it down a little bit, thank you. After the rapture, the seat of power will shift from Washington, D.C. to Rome, Italy, and then after three and a half years, after Antichrist's major opponent has been removed from the scene, and that is Russia, I believe the uh, invasion of Gog and Magog, as we'll see in a minute, comes in the middle of the tribulation period. Um, then Antichrist moves his headquarters to Jerusalem. The last verse of Daniel 11 speaks of that, and, and he'll establish his headquarters between the two seas, meaning the Mediterranean or the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. So we have Antichrist who goes under various names as the Roman prince, the Antichrist, the little horn, the willful king, the man of sin, the wicked one, and so on, rule over the world. His dominion is for three and a half years over part of the world. The revived Roman Empire may be constituted of Arabic nations, or part Arabic or part uh, Northern European, Whatever the 
extent of his empires. I think uh, his rule might well extend to North America. After all, we are jurisprudentially, linguistically, and culturally, not entirely, but mostly European. So for the first three and a half years, America has passed from the scene, and a Christ, a strong Roman ruler, takes over in Europe and rules over 10 nations. And then at the bottom of page nine, um, no, I'm sorry, bottom of page eight, I mentioned the chastisement of Russia. I won't argue the, the timing. I mentioned there are eight different times that have been suggested for the invasion of Israel by Gog and Magog. This writer finds the middle of the tribulation period to be the most likely time for the attack. Israel is in peace and safety, living in unwalled villages without gates and without bars. Have you been to Israel recently? Have you seen that wall <laughs> around Bethlehem? You see, that's, that's done now. I mean, I know how you could reinterpret that, but I just think uh, it's a time when Israel is protected by Antichrist. They're in peace and safety, but I won't argue with you on that. That's any position you want to hold is fine with me. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is when Russia invades Israel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, other nations, apart from the Confederates, other nations stand by and say, what are you doing? Are you come to take a spoil? Are you come to take a prey? And I think America will stand by in utter amazement at that lightning strike of Russia against Israel. And just as suddenly, God will do the Russian sin, right? At the end of Ezekiel 38, you have eight specific judgments. God opens the arsenals of heaven and lets the invaders have it. Earthquake, every wall in Israel will fall to the ground. That's how the Dome of the Rock will probably be removed. <laughs> Civil war, those nations will be fighting against each other. Pestilence, blood, rain, floods, and then God uses the same judgment he used against Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone. The power of vacuum with Russia and her satellites totally out of the way will allow Antichrist to be a worldwide ruler. But even though he rules the world, and the Book of Daniel is very plain on that, and so is Revelation 13. He will never quite be successful in subjugating all the nations because there are people who are trying to take his rule away from him, maybe in conjunction with one another. The Russians, at the, uh, in, in Daniel 11, we have the four armies moving against Israel. Dr. Pentecost, I think, rightly says this is the the um, movement of, it's a campaign, not just one battle, of various armies. The Russians come down, a few more that are left after Gog and Mega. Uh, the Egyptians first come up. I mentioned that the action by Egypt, the attack by um, Russia, Daniel 1140, the advance of Rome. Antichrist gets wind of that and he moves into Israel. And then he hears tidings out of, the, out of the north and east that, that will trouble him, and that is 200 million, an army of 200 million that are after his jugular. You'd be concerned as well if you heard this army was coming after you, but interestingly, he's able to decimate them all. He's able to do all of the men. And when all seems lost for Israel, with hundreds of millions of soldiers, in the mountains and in the valleys. There's another army that comes, and you and I are going to be part of that army. Revelation 11, 19, 11, the rider on the white horse, Jesus Christ, and then in verse 14, you and I are mentioned, and the saints which were in heaven shall follow him from heaven. And that's the part we will have in the end of the tribulation. We're just watching the Savior take the situation, take care of the situation on earth. So, for three and a half years, uh, battles will rage. It, it's a most bloody confrontation, uh, more than we can imagine, because in Revelation 14, 20, it says, blood will be up to the horse's bridle for the space of 200 miles. Israel is a very small country. It's wide, it's, as you know, 65 miles. How do you get 200 miles, river blood? If the blood flows, as I mentioned, down into the 
Mediterranean and part of it into the Jordan Valley, down the Jordan to the southern end of the Dead Sea. That's how you get 200 miles, four feet deep in all the low places. Nothing like that has ever existed before. I had a farmer figure out for me once in Anita, Iowa. I did a series on prophecy. He said, I want to figure out, you know, these 200 million people, how much blood is there in the human person, volume-wise? And we figure that out. And then he did some math, and he figured out just from one of these armies, 200 million, there's a river of blood an eighth of a mile wide, four feet deep, 200 miles. Doesn't mention anything about the horse, uh, the blood of the horses and the, of the other soldiers. We, we just can't imagine it, but I take that very, very literally. The evaluation of the United States in prophecy. How do you figure America in, in the end time picture? And that's what we want to get at. They already alluded to the fact that it seems though God will need America right up until the rapture. Well, some believe that America is to be equated with Babylon in the book of the Revelation. Loxton suggests that the wealthy, powerful, wicked, God-forsaking end time nation spiritually called Babylon in prophecy is the USA. And then Isaiah 18 has been a favorite passage of commentators, uh, some who say America is intended because there's a land over shadow or shadowing with wings, which is beyond the river Ethiopia. I've always had trouble with placing America in Africa somewhere, but the, these people by uh, exegetical sleight of hand can do that. I think it's gross spiritualizing to see America there. It's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, not in across the ocean from Ethiopia. Besides that, the land overspreading wings ha has nothing to do with eagle's wings. Um, the eagle was a symbol <laughs> of Germany, Austria, Spain, Poland, Wikipedia lists over 20 nations whose national symbol is the eagle. But it doesn't mean eagle's wings. Dr. Unger in his very fine commentary in the Old Testament says, it apparently, the land is Ethiopia, ancient or modern Sudan, the reference to the, not eagle's wings, but buzzing of insect wings. It's quite a difference. A land overshadowed by eagle's wings or buzzing of insect wings evidently describes one of the most pestiferous insects or all of them for which the country was notorious. I'm indebted to Mal Couch for getting Unger's commentary on the Old Testament republished. I think most of you probably have that, right? How many of you studied under Dr. Unger at Dallas Seminary? Arnold, you were in his classes, weren't you? And some of you did. We enjoyed going to his classes just to listen and pray. There's a man who had hold of God in prayer. You could just tell something of his spiritual sensitivity. And that's why... In his commentary, that comes through. He planned, I don't know if you remember that, if you attended his class, he planned to write a commentary on the whole Bible, but the Lord took him home prematurely. He had brain cancer. And I think a year after his death, his Old Testament commentary was published, which was out of print for, I don't know, 20-some years till now, uh, had it reprinted. I came down here a year ago, to do some research, and because I knew Dr. Unger had told me, had told us that it started on the New Testament. And guess what I found? A gold mine of Unger on the Synoptic Gospels. 864 pages. He finished Matthew, Mark, Luke, through John chapter 5. Let me know if you're interested, but it's a gold mine of information. It is really well worth having. I'm just saying, Dr. Unger's fruitful ministry left a deep imprint on our lives, those who studied under him, and his work lives on in his excellent, excellent books. Okay, some see a reference to the United States in Ezekiel 38, verse 13. The merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, protest against the invasion of Israel by a northern power, it is suggested that Tarshish is England and America is one of the young lions or colonies. Well, I seem to agree with Maxwell Coder, who said, many attempts have been made to find America in the prophetic scriptures. 
All of them have been rejected by conservatives as violating rules of exegesis. So the question you've asked in your books and your articles, why isn't America mentioned in those prophetic passages directly? Well, they're very suggestions. By the time of the rapture, America has passed out of existence. Does that mean Australia, Japan, or South Africa have also not, which are also not mentioned, have passed out of existence? Uh, just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean it no longer exists, but you would think that the mightiest power on earth would be mentioned, wouldn't you? Some say America has been conquered by Russia or some other nation. Right now, Red China is the likely candidate. But what you'd have to do, and some, some of you discussed that earlier in this conference, uh, if you have another world empire, whether Russia or China, you have to do something to the beasts, insert another beast in Daniel 7, and probably put another set of kneecaps in that image on Daniel 2, because you can only have four world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the final stage, the ten-toe stage, the ten-horn stage, the kingdom that is destroyed when a stone cut without mountains, cut without hands from the mountains, crushes the feet of that image, the dirt of that image is scattered, that mountain fills the whole earth, and that's the millennial kingdom of Christ, the rock of ages. So even at the height of communism, during the height of the Cold War, people said, aren't you afraid that com the communists will take over America? I said, well, they're planning to. When I went through their school system, they said by 1975, that's what they were teaching us, we will overtake, not just overtake, but conquer America. We have a proverb in German, der Mensch denkt und gut lenkt. Man proposes, but God disposes. They wanted to be a world empire, and so does China. So did Hitler want to be, and so did Napoleon. But there's only one nation that could have been a world power that didn't use that, that uh, military prowess, and that's the United States of America. We've freed nations and then left them. You bombed Germany to the smithereens, and then you helped us rebuild through the Marshall Plan. <laughs> We did Japan in, and then we helped Japan back on its feet. So why do I believe that the United States will probably exist until the rapture? Okay, that's my fourth point. The United States seems to be especially designed by God to serve four purpose, or three major purposes. Two I already stated, and the third I've implied. America is a missionary nation. It promotes missionary activity. We send out more missionaries than anyone else. Now, even if America perished as a nation, there'd still be the gospel around the world. God will never leave himself without a witness. But most of the works around the world would dry up because they're supported with American finances. Most of them would. After the rapture, God has other witnesses around, like the 144,000, like Elijah who's coming again, Matthew 11, 17, 17, 11, like the two witnesses who will be ministering in Jerusalem, like the angel, Revelation 14, 6, who's going to preach the gospel in every nation. But until the rapture, it seems as though God needs a missionary nation. Secondly, until the rapture, until Antichrist takes over in that covenant, Israel needs a nation to protect it. I don't know what would happen to, to Israel if our president, who is moving, I know, in that direction, wants to support, pull away support from Israel, military and economic. Right now we're supporting them at the tune of Oh, I see figures between 1.5 billion and 3 billion dollars a year. Normally, that would amount to about 45 dollars an American for our tax, for American taxpayer. That's the best form of insurance I can think of. I don't like foreign aid being scattered to the winds, but when we give it to Israel, even though they're in unbelief, God will continue to honor us for that, and I think He needs our nation right up until the rapture. 
which may only mean the rapture will be tomorrow or soon thereafter. Thirdly, America provides a home for the politically and religiously persecuted all around the world. There's that sign on the Statue of Liberty by Emma Lazarus, which you've probably seen. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Is America still doing that? Are we welcoming immigrants? Sure. When I land in Chicago, there's one uh, bank of counters for American citizens. There's another bank for uh, visitors or uh, foreigners. There are just as many foreigners coming in normally as there are citizens. I'm glad they're coming here. I hope they don't stay illegally. I do have my documents. I'm a documented alien, mind you. But, <laughs> but uh, America still draws people from around the world because they know this is what America is all about. God will not let America's sins go unpunished, but the well-deserved and long-delayed judgment that I mentioned earlier will not come until the righteous have been removed. As he removed Noah and his family before he brought the flood, as he removed Lot before the des destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, so God will remove the believers through the rapture before he sends judgment upon the earth, including our beloved nation. And then just very briefly as we summarize 11 areas where we can fit in a general way, at least, our beloved country into the end time events. will be preserved, as I suggest, until the rapture. Secondly, after the rapture, pandemonium will break out. In Daniel 12, 1, we read of a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time. Since the indignation of the Lord will come upon all nations, his indignation comes upon America. In Isaiah 24, verse 20, we read that the earth will reel to and fro like a trunkard. I mean, when the earth shakes all over the place, that'll include a very serious shaking in America. I counted at one time, I think there are at least nine earthquakes predicted for the tribulation period and its end. And then, sadly, America will become anti-Semitic, the persecution of Israel. Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, you will be hated of all nations. With the Christian element, the Christian influence gone from America, America will viciously turn upon the Jewish people, and they're making a beeline for Israel. I can't blame them. And in Ezekiel chapter 39, to the end of the chapter, we read that every single Jew will return in connection with the Battle of Gog and Magog. It begins with Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, at the end of chapter 39, you have every Jew in Israel. It doesn't explicitly state the reason, but Christ said you'll be persecuted all over the place. Participation in the Roman Empire. It may well be that we will be, become a territorial extension of the revived Roman Empire seeing that America's religious culture and political roots lie in Europe. Perplexity at Gog and Magog, I already mentioned. Nations will stand by and watch Russia and her satellites move into Israel. But at the end of Ezekiel 39, they will rejoice and many Gentiles and Jewish people will come to know Jesus Christ in a personal way when they see what God does in the destruction of Israel's major enemy it will lead to the deliverance, to the salvation of many, many people. The preaching of the 144,000 and an angel. I'm sure all of you have been asked, will people be saved in the tribulation period? The Bible speaks of uh, people through the preaching of the 144,000 and the angel, Revelation 14, 6, from every kind kindred, every tongue, Every nation be safe. That includes the United States, where the gospel is known. I know there are some who will believe the lie of the Antichrist. We don't need to enter into the theological niceties of that now, but people from America will be saved. There are more people saved in the tribulation period than during any given seven-year period of human history. I say that because uh, 
if I understand Zechariah 13, 8 correctly, when Christ comes back and judges the Jewish people, two-thirds will go under the rod, but one-third will be saved. One-third of the Jewish people in the tribulation will trust in Christ as their Messiah. That's a very good percentage. The punishment, punishments of the tribulation, if by the middle of the tribulation period half the world's population perishes through two judgments alone, Revelation 6, 8, as a result of the pale horse, and Revelation 9, 15, the demon spirits released from the pit, one-fourth and then one-third of the world's population are destroyed. That would include, I think, a large percentage of Americans. So I never say to people, well, if you don't trust in Christ now, wait till the tribute. And then you see we, we fundamentalists were right. We were right about the rapture. It's not any more likely that they'll trust in Christ then as they do now. Because when they harden their hearts, the, they harden the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible's emphasis is today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart as the Israelites did in the day of provocation. Americans will participate at Armageddon. How do you know that American soldiers will be over there? Because it says in Zechariah 12, verse 3, and Zechariah 14, verses 1 and 2, that all the world's armies, Revelation 16, verse 14 and 15, all the world's armies will be gathered at Armageddon. And then Jesus Christ comes back and those people who have been hiding from Antichrist and didn't die a martyr's death enter, they are believers, enter the millennial kingdom and they'll populate the millennial earth and Jesus Christ is going to reintroduce some of the feast days. Zechariah 14 mentions the feast of the tabernacles and every citizen on earth, we don't, we are going to be there with Christ as the bride in Jerusalem we're going to be there for, with him for a thousand years in the earthly Jerusalem, but people will be coming up once a year to worship the Lord. That includes Americans. They may not go with you on your Israel tour now, but they all have to go. There. Otherwise, zap, 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 they'll be punished. Read uh, uh, Zechariah 14. Prosperity in the kingdom, all the nations will prosper, and the curse will be lifted from nature. I flew the other day to the West Coast and on to Hawaii, but when you fly from Denver westward, you fly for at least two hours over nothing. The deserts of America, in the Sahara, I flew once to Benin, West Africa from, from Brussels, two, three hours over, those desert areas will be fertile then, and all the deserts will have rivers um, bringing life, rejuvenating them the bad lands of America will be healed. And then finally, looking far, far into the future, those nations in the millennium where people are saved will go on into the eternal state, the heavenly Jerusalem, and they will be there worshiping the Lord. It says, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. I don't know exactly how that is, uh, uh, goes, uh, happens, but who lives in the new Jerusalem? Apparently the 12 tribes of Israel may be around Jerusalem because each of the 12 gates has the name of one of the tribes of Israel, and then there are nations settling somewhere on the new earth. You and I are the bride, that's our home, but there are people who are saved in the tribulation and saved in the millennial kingdom who will still come into the city and worship the Savior. So I don't think America is doomed. We should pray for America. You all know Second Chronicles 7, 14. By direct interpretation, that's Israel, but uh, my people humble themselves, pray. I will once in a while, I might possibly, no, I will answer their prayers. So keep praying for America, and don't give up on America. I haven't. I don't think God has. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was the greatest German poet, I think, who ever lived. He said to a friend at one time, give me the benefit of your convictions if you have any, 
but keep your doubts to yourself. I have enough of my own. <laughs> there are all sorts of doubts we have, but there are some positive things we can and should say about America, not just emphasizing the negative aspects now. We need to pray for our country, but do what we are called to do as a nation, witness for the Lord, and worship him in spirit and in truth. And may we do that by God's grace. Thank you. Thank you.